I am on assignment today. I'm going to read eight verses. I'm from the book of John, the 12th chapter, and we will read them together. I'll read them and you just follow along. John, the 12th chapter. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. John 12 and 1, then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. And there was made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. And then Mary took a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his, his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then says one of the disciples, Judas, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bared what was put therein. And then Jesus said, let her alone against the day of my bearing has she kept this. Last verse, for the poor always you have with me, with you, but me ye have not always. And the people of God shouted, amen. I'm going to continue in the vein in which I started last week, a call to generosity. I'm going to continue with this, a call to generosity. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. Come on, put your hands together for the word of the Lord like you mean it. Let me try this. Put your hands together for the word of the Lord like you believe it. I want to continue talking from last week. I talked about a call to generosity. And I began, I offered actually a pathway to repentance for us to find our way back to the heart of God. John Bevere, I made mention of this last week, I'm not sure if you caught it, but John Bevere made, gave us a quote that has been quoted as saying, the most important doctrines of the scriptures are the ones that the devil tries the heart to pervert. Those most important verses in the Bible, the devil works diligently to pervert them to keep believers from seeing victory in those areas of their lives. I love the fact that the Bible have many verses. In fact, I told you last week, we had 2,300 verses on spirit of generosity. I also made mention of the fact that you can give and not love, but it is impossible to love and not give. True, I, true generosity, believers, hear me, is based on our identity as a child of God. We ought to reflect our Father's image in our generosity. I want to share this story with you. Uh, it is a story of, of a, from long ago from Alexander the Great, and it has been written about him. So I want you to just kind of catch the heart of this story. The story is told that one day a beggar by the roadside asked for alms of Alexander the Great as he passed by. The man was poor and wretched and had no claim upon the ruler, no right to even lift, lift up a solicitation um, at his hand. Yet the emperor threw him several gold coins. The carrier was astonished at the generosity and commented to the Alexander the Great, Sir, copper coins would have adequately met the beggar's need. Why did you give him gold? And Alexander the Great responded in royal fashion, copper coins would have suited the beggar's needs but gold coins suit Alexander's giving. Yeah, so, so when we reflect the give, generosity of our father, we should not give like we mere beggars. We should reflect the energy and the gold that God has for us. Amen? You should always remember that your gift is going to leave your hand but never leaves your life. And generosity will always be rewarded. Blessings are a byproduct of our generosity. And so this morning, I want to propose a quote to you, if, it will, if, if I can. Is it, too, is, it, is, it, 
impossible to be too generous? Is it impossible to be too generous, to be over generous, an extravagant generous giver? Is it impossible to be like that? And there are many who struggle with this, and, and, and you can tell that they feel some kind of way by the way they respond to someone else's generosity. See, our text today offers us a tale, a story of extravagant generosity, as well as someone who struggles in it. And I want to kind of pick that apart because we're going to read our text again. But this time, I want you to open your heart and see what Jesus is trying to teach us in this powerful moment about extravagant generosity. Um, Let's look at it again, this time from the New King James Version. It said, then six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus, who had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those that sat at the table with him. Verse 3. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of, of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, son of whom... Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, verse 5, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box. And he used it to take whatever was put in. But Jesus said, let her alone. She kept, she kept this for the day of my burial. The poor you have with you always, but me you won't. Now, after reading this, hopefully we can begin to see two polar opposites uh, in this characteristics of these few verses. Number one, Mary Hart is filled with extraordinary generosity. And secondly, Judas Hart is filled with selfishness, anti-generosity. The truth is, when we look at, at, at these two, most of us fall somewhere in between the two of them. Hopefully, hopefully, we're not as selfish as Judas, but probably not most of us is, are as generous as Mary. And so I want to take a moment and look at both of these characters, and I want to help us to understand this. First, let's look at Mary's extravagant generosity. Many theologians believe that her gift cost about a year's salary. Can you imagine going to Vistar and pulling out a year's worth of salary And bringing it to the house of the Lord. Can you imagine that? Of course, the obvious question would be, why would she do that? Why would she do that? Why would Mary choose to be so generous at that moment? And my opinion is love. See, love is a powerful, a powerful tool when it comes to our generosity. Nothing else could move us to make that kind of move unless we love somebody. Now, pride, pride will let you give a little something when everybody's looking. Just so you look like you're giving. But love will make you sacrifice and you ain't worried about if anybody looking. See, now watch this. Because Judas' selfishness is the thing that I want to kind of pull out. Because I believe in breaking the power of selfishness. First, did anyone notice how Judas got all up in Mary's business all of a sudden? I I, I probably would have said something like, why are you worried about what I'm giving? You know what I'm saying? Why would anyone care about someone else being overly generous with their money? Why would anyone care if someone is overly generous with their possessions or what they give? What I've come to realize, believers, is this. When someone has a lot to say about someone else's extravagant giving, it reflects the guiltiness of their own selfishness. When they're worried about what I'm giving, it reflects how little they are responding to it. See, Mary's bright light shined on them and made, made Judas look real bad. So Judas is sitting around looking out crazy. Saying, well, we could have used that money for something else. But listen to these verses again, John 12, 4 through 6. And then one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, said, why was, not, why was this ointment not sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? 
And this he said, not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear to put in. Judas was disguising his own selfish motives. He didn't care about the poor. He just had his hand in the cookie jar. And this amazing act of generosity made him look bad. See, Robert Morris, I don't know if you know who he is. He's a, he's a pastor out on the West Coast, has a book written called The Blessed Life. And the inside of this book called The Blessed Life, he lays out this one story that I love to share with you. He says, I was riding with another pastor by the home of a man who was a committed Christian who was very wealthy. I commented on how the man was very generous. And the pastor friend said, well, he ought to sell that thing, talking about his house, and give the money to the poor. And so Morris said, well, you live in a pretty nice home yourself. Why don't you sell your home and give it to the poor? The truth is, you don't really care about the poor. You're just jealous of God's blessing over another brother's life. See, I, I brought that up because false spirituality is still alive today. It's still happening today. It's just like it was in Judah's heart on the day that Mary broke that thing out of that alabaster box, if you will. People's hearts are still wicked, and many of them are still rebelling against the ways of God laid out in the Scripture. I continue to preach to us that we must protect our hearts from sin, that we must do everything we can to make sure sin does not pollute our heart. We must be aware, and I don't know if anybody else besides me, are you ever aware of when the devil is trying to use you? Can't get, I ain't got but three hands right there. That, 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 because we seem to think that we're always holy and righteous, but inside of this room are some folk who have been susceptible to the wiles of the enemy. And I don't care how holy you are, on some days you're not always up to speed on following what God says. And the enemy tries to seep into our hearts, but we must be aware of when that wickedness tries to grab us and take over our heart. Because if we don't watch it, it will begin to defile our actions. And see, we don't want to hear that. When wickedness seeps into your heart, if you don't cast it down, if you don't get rid of it, if you don't cast it out, rebuke the devil from trying to seep in, if you're not aware of your own weaknesses, if you're not aware of the enemy whispering in your ear, if you think you're so holy and all of that stuff, man, I, I am what I am by the grace of God. If God doesn't touch me, I'm a jacked up joker. If God doesn't keep me, I'm a hot mess. And on any day, any day, I have the, I have the proclivities to mess up. Is there anybody here besides me that can thank God that he's working in your life to the point that you're standing not on your own, not in your own ability, not in your own power, but where the people here thankful that you're standing in the grace of God and that God is keeping you.